Hey everyone, picture this. Ethan, your everyday park ranger, a guy who finds peace in the darkness of the night forest, suddenly hits a bump in his routine. On a night like any other in Rocky Mountain National Park, an out-of-place rhythm of knocks in the dead of the woods throws a curveball into his quiet night shift. By the break of dawn, he's standing face to face with a puzzle that nature itself can't solve. It's the kind of story that transforms an ordinary patch of trees into an absolutely extraordinary mystery. So if you're itching for a tale that's as bizarre as it is true, don't go anywhere else and sit yourself right down. Here is Ethan's story, and it is about to change the way you hear the sounds of the night. So you know how sometimes you end up in situations where your brain goes, nope, not dealing with this today. Well, that's what happened to Ethan. This dude loved the night shift. Yeah, loved it. The kind of love you have for a good old couch that's seen better days but is comfy as heck. He worked as a park ranger, and that meant he spent his nights surrounded by the kind of silence that makes your ears ring. Ethan was no stranger to the random noises that come with the territory. The crack of a twig, the rustle of leaves, you name it. But this one night, things got weird. It started with a knock, not the, oh look, a woodpecker kind of knock, but a rhythmic, intentional kind of sound. Knock, knock, knock. It echoed, bouncing off the valley walls like some creepy Morse code. Now Ethan wasn't one to spook easily, but this sound had him on edge. It wasn't an animal. He'd bet his favorite flashlight on that. And it wasn't the wind. This was a still night the kind where the air feels like it's holding its breath. He spent the rest of his shift with one ear cocked, waiting for it to happen again. It didn't. So when dawn cracked, Ethan was out there, walking through the park with the first light painting everything that calm gold color. He was trying to convince himself he'd imagined the whole thing. But then he saw the trees. It was like a giant had come through, twisting the branches into shapes that made no sense. It wasn't random damage like you'd see after a storm. This was deliberate, artistic almost. In a wild, twisted way, the hairs on the back of his neck stood up because nature doesn't do right angles and spirals on its own. There was this one tree, its branches woven into a kind of arch. Ethan walked through it, and that's when he found the tracks. They were big way too big for any critter that called the park home. And the stride was all wrong for a person, too long, too heavy. He followed them, his heart doing that thing where it feels like it's trying to beat its way out of your chest. The tracks led to the edge of a lake, right to the water's edge. And that's where he saw it, the dog man. This wasn't some Halloween costume or a trick of the light. It was as real as the ground beneath Ethan's boots. It stood on two legs, covered in fur that looked like the night sky had fallen on it, dark, with flecks of gray. Its eyes, man, its eyes were like molten gold, burning in a face that was too wolf to be human and too human to be wolf. Ethan froze. You know that feeling, right? When your brain's yelling, run, you idiot, but your legs are like, Nah, we're good here. It was looking right at him, and there was this sense of, I don't know, recognition? Like it knew Ethan, knew he'd heard the knocks, knew he'd come looking. The dogman tilted its head, the way your dog does when you're eating something and it's hoping you'll share. Except Ethan wasn't about to toss it a Scooby snack. And then just like that, it turned and loped off into the forest, moving with a grace that didn't fit its size. Ethan stood there for who knows how long, staring at the spot where it disappeared. The silence of the morning felt different now, heavy with a secret that was just his to keep. Because who'd believe him? He didn't even believe it, and he'd seen it with his own eyes. The rest of the day passed in a blur. Ethan did his rounds, fixed a sign or two, but his mind was on that dogman. Night came again, and he was back on shift, listening. But there were no knocks that night, or any night after. And the trees? They stayed twisted up, 
a reminder that some things don't have an explanation. Ethan never saw the Dogman again, but he knew it was out there, a part of the park as much as the trees and the lakes. He kept an ear out every night, though, half hoping, half dreading he'd hear those knocks again. But some secrets, it seems, are meant to be kept, and some creatures are meant to be mysteries. And Ethan? He was okay with that. Because not knowing, not for sure, it keeps the world interesting, doesn't it? So I've got this tale for you straight out of Duluth, Minnesota. Never thought I'd be the one to tell it, but here we are. It's about Emma Carlson, an officer who's been patrolling the Lake Superior shoreline longer than she'd care to admit. Folks around here respect her. She's got an eye for detail and a knack for figuring things out that don't make sense at first glance. It started like any other whisper of gossip you'd hear in a lakeside town, fishermen spinning tales of something strange in the water. They said it was unlike any fish or log bobbing in the waves. This was something else. Most folks didn't give the stories much attention, but not Emma. She had a gut feeling that there was more to these stories. Something in the way these seasoned fishermen clutched their caps and refused to meet each other's eyes told her this was no ordinary fish story. She started to ask around, casually at first, but the more she heard, the less it all made sense. The fishermen spoke of a creature, large and indistinct, moving under the water with purpose. It wasn't aggressive, they said, just there, as if it had always been a part of the lake, just out of sight. They'd catch glimpses when the dawn mist clung to the water, or as dusk turned the waves to molten silver. Each sighting was a brushstroke in a larger picture that no one could quite see clearly. Curiosity turned to mild obsession for Emma. She pored over local legends, the stories passed down through generations that most considered nothing more than campfire tales to spook the kids. But the threads were there. Tales of a guardian spirit of the lake. A creature that was part of the very essence of Superior itself. The investigation was slow going. Emma's days off were spent out on the lake, her eyes scanning the water, hoping for a chance to see something for herself. And then... One evening, as the sun dipped low and the sky turned a purplish color, it happened. She wasn't sure what made her look up, but there it was. A serpentine form undulating gracefully just beneath the water's surface. It was massive, spanning what looked like the length of two boats end to end. Its skin was like liquid night, absorbing the fading light and its eyes. They glowed with a pale, almost luminescent hue that seemed to pierce right through the veil of water between them. Emma's heart hammered in her chest, her breath caught in her throat. She watched, motionless, as the creature moved with an ancient grace, its presence both terrifying and awe-inspiring. It was a part of the lake in a way that she could never have imagined. In that moment, she understood what the fishermen had struggled to put into words. This creature was as much a part of their lives as the tides and the changing seasons. As it passed beneath her boat, she could feel a kind of communication, a sense of understanding that didn't need words. The creature's gaze held hers, and a cascade of images flooded her mind. The history of the lake, the generations of people who had lived beside it, and the silent promise that the creature's presence was a sign of the lake's health and vitality. When it slipped away into the depths, leaving only the gentle lapping of water against the hull, Emma sat there for a long time, the afterimage of the creature's eyes etched into her vision. She knew that the story of her encounter would be met with skepticism, that it would be easier to keep it to herself. But there was a bigger picture. The legends weren't just stories. They were a cultural heritage a living history of the people and the lake they depended on. She went back to shore with a renewed sense of purpose. The tales she'd heard and the creatures she'd seen wove together, forming a narrative she felt compelled to share. It wasn't just about a mysterious aquatic creature. 
It was about respect for the lake and the life it sustained. Emma became a liaison of sorts, a bridge between the old legends and the modern world. She organized gatherings where the elders shared their stories and the fishermen spoke of their sightings. Together, they created a new understanding of Lake Superior, not as a resource to be exploited, but as a living entity to be respected. And as for Emma, she still patrols the shoreline, her eyes ever watchful. But now, there's a different kind of smile on her face when she looks out over the water, one that speaks of secrets shared and a truth that binds them all to the vast, mysterious lake. You know, it's funny how you get used to things like, I've been a ranger at Glacier National Park for years, and the quiet never bothered me. In fact, that's what I loved about the off-season. Just me, the mountains, and the kind of silence you can't find unless you're deep in the wilderness. So, checking the trail cameras was just routine. Nothing ever really changed. Until one day, it did. So there I was, the cold biting at my cheeks, making my rounds before the deep snow made it a real chore. I'd swing by the trail cams, those little electric eyes we've got perched in the wild to keep tabs on the wildlife. Usually it's just a bunch of night shots of deer or the occasional bear bum shuffling through the brush. But that night, I found one camera face down in the dirt, like it had seen something so shocking it fainted. I chuckled at the thought of that happening, propped it back up, and decided to check the footage back at the station. A mug of steaming coffee would make reviewing the footage much more enjoyable. So once I got back, I flipped the switch and hunkered down to watch. The screen flickered to life, and there it was. Not a bear, not a deer, but something... I'm not sure what. Something tall and pale, moving all wrong, like it was part human, part shadow, all wrong. I remember leaning forward, squinting, thinking, what in the world? It was a curveball I hadn't expected. The timestamp on the video said just after midnight when this figure strolled by. It was large, larger than any person had any right to be, and it had this pale look to it. Not like it was sickly, but like it wasn't made for daylight. It was gaunt, really gaunt, with limbs that seemed too long for its body, and it walked with this gait that seemed like every step was a chore. The way it moved, it was like it was fighting against a wind that wasn't there. I must have watched that clip a dozen times, trying to make sense of it. Was it fog or mist in the air? Someone screwing around, trying to stir up a legend or something? I was literally coming up with any plausible thought I could. But the more I watched it, the less sense it made. It didn't look right didn't move right, and the thing that got me the most was how the eyes looked. You could just make them out on the footage, too big for its face, and they seemed to reflect the moonlight like an animal's. I showed it to a couple of the other rangers, but they were just as stumped as I was. We've all seen our fair share of weirdness in the woods, but this took the cake. It didn't fit any pattern, didn't match any known animal behavior that any of us had experienced or learned about. And it wasn't just the figure itself. It was the feeling it left you with. Like you'd seen something you weren't supposed to. Something that wasn't part of our normal world. A secret of some kind. The next few nights, I found myself drawn to that spot where I found the downed camera. I don't know what I was expecting to find. Tracks, maybe. Or some sign that it was just a person after all. But there was nothing. No footprints. No scraps of clothing caught on the brush. Nothing. I went over it all in my head, every possibility, but none of them fit. It was like my brain couldn't hold on to the thought of it for too long before it slipped away, like it was too strange for my mind to want to keep. I'm not much for ghost stories or conspiracy theories. I always figured there's an explanation for everything, even if we don't know it yet. But this, this was something else. It was like a puzzle with pieces missing, and no picture on the box to guide you. The footage is locked away now, 
marked as an unidentified animal sighting. We get a few of those from time to time, and usually they turn out to be a lost dog or a blurry photo of a deer. But this one's different. It doesn't get mentioned much, but it's there, this unspoken question among the staff. I still work the trails, still enjoy the quiet, but sometimes, when the sun dips behind the peaks and the shadows get long, I find myself looking over my shoulder, wondering if whatever it was is still out there, watching, and I can't shake the feeling that it knows something we don't, something about the wild places of the world where the maps end and the mysteries just begin. And believe me when I tell you that there are a lot of those wild places here in Glacier. At the time of this encounter, I was a park ranger at a state park in Arkansas. The place was just gorgeous. Arkansas is known as the natural state since there's so much scenic beauty there. One of the main attractions are the waterfalls. Arkansas has about 300, and some of the best ones tend to be in more remote and mountainous areas. Part of my job was to maintain the access points to these falls in order to minimize risks for people coming to visit them. A lot of my days started really early. I would get on the trails first thing in the morning to check if there were any hindrances. Things happen like flooded creeks, quick mud, dangerous wildlife, etc. The rainy season is approximately October through May. The best time to see the waterfalls is in the rainy season since a lot of the falls go down to a trickle in the summer. So I was out there in a lot of wet weather. The job isn't for everyone. It involved a lot of isolation and rugged terrain. I was pretty much always wearing my steel-toed wading boots and carrying climbing tools and ropes and stuff. I enjoyed the isolation though. I've always been an introvert and never was hesitant to get out there alone. One morning I was headed to a pretty remote area that had been impacted by flooding and long-time water erosion. I needed to assess the damage. It had been closed to the public and we wanted to make it accessible again. I got up before sunrise and drove out. When I got there, the road went from gravel to dirt, which is common in backwoods Arkansas. Eventually, the road became no longer recognizable because of some past mudslides and rock slides. I had to park my truck and head into the blocked area on foot. There was quite a bit of destruction on the old road, and I had to bushwhack my way through a lot of spots. I eventually came upon the creek, so I knew I was on the right path. I hadn't ever actually been to this waterfall before, and I was relying on GPS, so I was glad to see the creek. I had to wade through the flooded creek for a couple of miles or so. I was really surprised when I suddenly came across an old, abandoned-looking vehicle next to the creek. It didn't have any license plates on it. The car was pretty beaten up. As I got closer, I saw a lot of scratches on the metal and a smashed window on one side. The window that was shattered had some type of cloth on it, and there were dark splotches all over the interior. I didn't really want to know what those were from. Maybe fungus or blood. Next to the car looked like someone had made a campsite of some sort. There were some old cans and what looked like remnants of a campfire. There were large rocks around it resembling seats. I noticed that the rocks had a layer of dirt on top of them that had formed a topsoil of sorts. That meant that the rocks had not been sat on in a long time. I wasn't even sure how long the road to this place had been closed. As far as I knew, it had never been open since I'd been hired for that area. It seemed that whatever had happened there had been quite a while ago. But that still doesn't ease your mind when you're in a pretty remote area all alone no matter how much you don't mind isolation. I kept going with my bushwhack machete unsheathed and my flare gun at hand. At that point, I was out of the creek and back up on the dirt road. I hadn't gone much further when I was assaulted by this horrendous smell like blood and rotten meat. It was what I imagined a slaughterhouse would smell like. It just came out of nowhere. I started to feel a creepy presence and I slowed my walking way down and started scanning the landscape. When I looked out past the creek, I saw a gigantic animal. It was crouched over a big deer carcass. My first thought was that it was a gargantuan wolf, but I know there aren't any wolves in Arkansas. 
and this thing was bigger than any wolf could be. It looked like a werewolf. It was bent over the carcass, eating. It had very long legs with very little fur on them. There was a huge mane around its neck and the tail was really puffy. The head was unnaturally large and the forearms were incredibly muscular. Seriously, if you try to bring up an image of a werewolf, that's the closest I can describe it. By some miracle, it didn't seem to know I was there. I held my breath and backed away so slowly, I felt like I was barely moving. It took what seemed like 1,000 years before I felt I was far enough away to turn around and make the long trek back to my truck. The whole way, I was gripped by a fear more intense than I had ever felt. I had all these wild thoughts going through my mind. Like, was that thing connected to the owner of that car? I didn't even want to imagine what might have happened. I notified the authorities about my finding of the car and sighting of the creature. I'm really not sure what measures they took to track it down, but that trail continues to be marked as off-limits to this day, as far as I know. I've told a few people about what I saw, but honestly, what are they supposed to think? None of them has ever come across such a thing. That's why I like to turn on your channel and reassure myself I'm not alone. Hi Lilith, I've been listening to your channel for a while now. Something that fascinates me every time I hear your stories is that, in every one I've listened to, the supernatural encounters all seem completely random. But here I am, writing to tell you about my personal brush with the supernatural, and it wasn't at all random. I guess you could call me a researcher, but I doubt any academic institution will claim me even if I do have some fancy initials to put behind my name. My official title is Wildlife Biologist. I work for the Bureau of Land Management in the Fish and Wildlife Division. But what I really am, and have been for over 20 years, is a monster hunter. 20 years is a long time, right? But that was how long it took until I had the encounter I'm about to tell you about. I'd been on my most recent hike in a remote park in Washington State. Did I mention that I spend most of my time away from civilization, following rumors of what was reported to be a weird bear? Given the area and territory we were working with, it wouldn't have been unusual for any sightings of a large, shaggy animal to be an actual bear. However, I had my doubts. The average brown bear or black bear is a very intelligent, large animal which is fixated on getting food, holding or gaining territory, or mating. It isn't shy of approaching areas that may have food or things they recognize as carrying food, and it will generally spook when confronted with things like bear horns or bear spray. Whatever this animal was, all the reports said that it was typically seen at the edges of the forest. It notably did not run away when hikers made noise. It also didn't move forward aggressively. But what really cinched the deal for me was the note in the report that the several hikers had smelled something odd, something like musty urine and old blood. According to the park ranger who took the report, the hikers had been horrified. Me? I was absolutely thrilled. Breaks like this were exactly what I was looking for. Given the area, I theorized that the animal they were spotting was a Sasquatch. There have been reported Bigfoot sightings in this area for decades, but no conclusive proof has ever been found. That's why I was there, for proof, or preferably, a specimen. I'd already spent several days scouting all the areas where sighting had been reported. While I never got a glimpse of what I was hunting, I did see enough evidence that I felt sure I was right. I'd found several impressions of large five-toed feet, torn bark on trees, and gleefully collected a few very smelly samples of hair, which I thought were promising. I set up trail cams at what looked like the most frequented spots and retreated to my base camp. Ordinarily, I'd work with another researcher, or at least have someone else to man the camera feeds while I handled the legwork. But when your department's budget depends on a politician's mood, you tend to lose your support staff. That made me the only occupant in a single large tent that was mostly full of surveillance equipment, work tables, and notes. 
the clearing I was camped in was clear enough that I could get a signal from all of my cameras, and I was the only human being for miles. I was secure in my tent and loaded with enough tranquilizer to knock a bull elephant on its butt before night fell. I wasn't expecting trouble, but I was also very aware that trouble happens when you least expect it, and I wasn't willing to trust my safety to the reports that the creature in the area never approached humans. I double-checked the camera feeds to make sure I was getting a clear picture and settled in for a long night. I said in the beginning of my letter that I'd been doing this for 20 years, 20 years of near sightings, finding only tangential evidence, nothing that ever really panned out. In most circles, my lack of serious results would have been caused to be fired. Fortunately, I worked for the government. I don't think I need to tell you how hard it is to be fired from a government job like this. My superiors were patient. They could afford to be. As long as they got what they wanted eventually, everything would work out. I have no problem telling you that I was hoping things would work out tonight. I might not be too worried about my job, but my professional pride would have liked to chalk up a win for once. If you've never been camping in deep woods, you don't have any idea of how dark it gets once night falls. Full moons can be bright, but the moon wasn't full that night. The only light I had was when I was watching my camera feeds from under a blind. For a long time, I got nothing but the expected nocturnal traffic. Deer, opossum, mice, nothing exciting until about 3 a.m. At 3.07 a.m., something large walked past camera four, close enough that all I could see was a big, dark blur. I immediately froze the image and enhanced it. With a little work, I could make out that the blur was a large clump of coarse hair. It was thick and scraggly, more like hanging moss than fur. I couldn't make out color in the night vision mode, but it was dark. I started to get hopeful. Then the camera was knocked over. It's a known fact among cryptid researchers that Sasquatches seem to have the ability to recognize the electrical fields put out by cameras, and they don't like them. So, when my camera was knocked over so that it was facing down, I wasn't concerned. But it wasn't just that camera. One by one, no matter where I had placed the trail cams, they were knocked over or taken offline. This was unexpected behavior. I wondered how the specimen could have found all of the cameras. Was there more than one? Could I have been lucky enough to find a family group? After the eighth camera went down, I wondered if the specimen was actively looking for them. That would have indicated an ability to handle sophisticated thought. I was fascinated. When the eleventh camera went down and it was a camera in a more remote area, another thought occurred. If it was actively looking for the cameras, was it also looking for me? Could it track me to my camp? I'm sure you understand when I say it wasn't a comforting thought. But what could I do? Packing up and leaving when I was so close? That wasn't going to happen. I tried to keep busy making what notes I could. It was hard to concentrate when I kept thinking about how something could be hunting me instead of the other way around. The nighttime sounds around me stopped like someone had cut off the soundtrack to the whole forest dead silence. That was when I heard it. Something was moving out in the dark, at the perimeter of the clearing. It was slow, and it wasn't small, not according to what I was hearing. I half expected the animal to stay where the tree line hit the open clearing. It didn't. Those slow footsteps sounded like they were approaching my tent. I stayed very, very still. I knew I had a tranquilizer, but tranks take time to work and until the medicine kicked in, I'd be vulnerable. I mean, here I was, about to meet something I'd spent 20 years chasing, and all I could think about was how alone I was. The creature, and I assumed it was a Sasquatch, circled the tent, always moving very slowly. He was probably at least 15 feet away, being cautious. Half of my mind took notes on behavior. The other half was getting, what's the term? Freaked out? It's not scientific, but it's accurate, so I'll use it. I was getting freaked out. There was a large animal, potentially a cryptid I'd spent my life trying to find, circling my tent. All I could hear was that slow pacing, but it seemed to be coming in closer to the tent with every rotation. 
Was it trying to find the source of the electronic signals? My equipment was covered to prevent light pollution, but it was still active. Something hit the side of the tent. I jumped. I'm not ashamed to say my heart tried to climb up my throat. It took me a few seconds to calm down and realize that it was a thing, not a body. From the size and sound, it was probably a rock. I waited for the specimen to come in next, but all it did was more of that slow circling. By now, it was close enough to hear breathing, heavy, almost wet sounding. I could smell that awful body odor and urine smell that every researcher and monster hunter swears is the calling card of Bigfoot. But there was something else too, musty blood. The creature stopped pacing on the left side of the tent. I held my breath. There was a slow dragging sound and then a ripping tear and something pointed and shiny slowly poked through the military-grade canvas of the tent wall. I can't remember what I was feeling. Excitement? Terror? Both? I do remember wishing I could grab a camera to record this moment. I made sure the trank was ready. All of a sudden, something crashed into the side of the tent where I had most of the electronics stationed. It was big enough and heavy enough to easily collapse that side of the tent. Not wanting to be tangled in yards of canvas with an angry creature, I tore open the entrance flap and got out. I still had my mag light on me, and I did what you've seen in every action movie. Put the flashlight way out in front of me. That's exactly what I did, and I aimed at the right side of the tent, where the creature was struggling to untangle itself. It was tangled in the tent side, but I could see it was big. I backed up a few steps and fired. The second the dart went in, the creature snarled and tore its way out of the tent. I finally got a good look at what I'd been chasing all these years. It was not a Sasquatch. It was tall, with broad shoulders, and while it stood on two legs, that's where any resemblance to humans left. The face, if I can call it a face, looked like a wolf or a dog more than any other animal. It was powerfully built, with a thick mane around its shoulders. I've seen bodybuilders with less muscle in their arms than this thing. It snarled into the beam of the flashlight and I thought, oh, I may have made a mistake. It took a step toward me and then another. I heard plastic snapping under its weight. It must have stepped on some of my equipment and it snarled. It was a long, low sound that made every primitive nerve in me stand to attention. I was sure it was going to charge me. I had the stupid thought that, well, at least someone else can use my research notes. That must have been when the tranquilizer started working, because it wobbled on its feet. It shook its head like it was trying to wake up, then dropped to all fours and took off toward the tree line again. My hands were shaking so badly from adrenaline that I couldn't reload fast enough. I think I managed to squeeze off one more, but I don't know if it hit. All I know is that the creature, whatever it was, was out of sight. I'm sure you're wondering what happened after that, how I explained the destruction of my equipment to both the rangers and my superiors, whether or not I hit with that second shot, and whether or not I caught up to the creature, whether the government now has its hands on a legitimate cryptid specimen. All I can say is that I'm now retired from field work, although I do still have a comfortable desk job and leave it up to you and your listeners to decide.